Welcome, my dearest year one law students, um, to day one of the rest of your lives. Um, no, it's, uh, well, yes, um, but more specifically, welcome to Legal English, um, the course that invites us to cover a broad range of topics, um, each one of them very briefly, too briefly, um, in order to help you prepare for your studies uh, for the next few years in English as optimally as possible. Um, this course comes during module one, before you have had a chance uh, to learn substantive law, uh, or simultaneous with your chance to learn your first substantive law in any case. Um, and so we naturally want um, and need you to learn some new concepts, some legal concepts um, during the course. Um, and, and therefore not only about how to read and write and speak about concepts you already know, but you'll have to learn a little bit from me um, about these concepts and how, um, people who study law in English learn a little bit in their first semester about um, these concepts. So I assure you though, it will be quite a lot of fun. That's my goal um, and I hope it's yours. So um, I am Elizabeth Perry and uh, I didn't actually mean for the camera to be on, but there it is. So I will, uh, I'll see if that's gonna cover future slides and turn it off if I have to. Um, but I wanna tell you uh, a little bit more about me um, on other occasions, bit by bit, uh, during the course. Um, but you've already read or seen, or you soon will see my brief introduction to myself uh, on the portal and, um, and all of the other introductions to all of you, which has been wonderful to see. Um, one thing I did not mention yet is um, that I recall very well my, my first semester in law school, my first term. And um, I was absolutely fascinated by all the new things we were learning. Um, also pretty overwhelmed and a little nervous and everything else. Um, I remember um, how much it helped me, um, what I was learning immediately uh, to understand the news on the radio and in newspapers and on the internet. Um, it immediately helped me better understand the legal effects of my daily life's activities, like renting a home, buying insurance, um, it also meant waking up, though, in the middle of the night sometimes realizing I was dreaming about a certain court case or a legal term or concept that we had learned um, or something in the footnotes of the reading I had just done. Ah, so it was a lot. Um, just expect that. If you expect that and know it's normal, I think that will help you with your anxiety level um, and keep you focused and uh, efficient and productive in studying. Um, okay happens to you, now you'll know, you already have heard from many people, I'm sure, that it's normal, you're not alone, um, and it means your mind is absorbing and processing a whole new world about which you knew relatively little before. Um, even for native English speakers like myself, with a pre-existing higher education, um, I studied for my bachelor's degree in biological sciences first and then went to law school in the US, where it's a graduate school. Um, had grown up there and legal English should have been therefore a little bit easier, maybe for me. Um, but the terms and concepts and practices from the world of law are often new and overwhelming for absolutely any law student. This is just fine. It's the way it should be. Steep learning curves are amazing and exciting, a uh, great experience in your life that you'll never forget. So I hope that you agree with that. Um, help each other out. Recognize the stress is normal. Recognize all sorts of feelings, including hating this stuff for a little while or thinking about stopping altogether. Those are normal experiences too. Um, and you'll do just fine. Try to take it one day at a time and, and get through it. Um, okay, so today's lecture introduces you to, as you see from its title, um, Legal English, the course we're about to embark on and also the academic and professional field called Legal English. Um, I'm also gonna do a little bit of housekeeping with you. Uh, so here we go. Moving on and I'm gonna click off the photo, rather the camera. Okay, so first we're gonna cover a few housekeeping items um, that will help you do well in your first weeks of the course. Um, then we will talk about the field of Legal English um, and 
than the course's aims and learning objectives, because I, I know you have read or you will this week be reading the course outline uh, on the portal as part of this week's homework. Um, so you, you should have read there about the course objectives and the setup for the course uh, sort of module by module. Um, and you'll have an overview understanding of the topics we're going to cover. So I'm not going to add even more to your plate today by reiterating all of that. Um, I, uh, I will talk in uh, next class, the seminar, a little bit about one of the main learning activities that you'll be doing, um, which I'm thinking uh, is the personal glossary notebook project. And I'll talk more about seminars and how they work. Um, in the next class on Friday, but, uh, or it may not be Friday if you're listening to this uh, in a different semester. I, I don't really want to mention specific dates and then accidentally forget that I did that in, in recording uh, lectures, but now I did it, Friday. <laughs> um, but to focus on these learning activities all at once would be a little overwhelming. So um, all you need to know for now is that we're going to focus in the course on helping you listen to legal English better than you can now, read it, write it, and otherwise work with it, um, specific to how a legal or a law student needs to do so, and how a legal professional, including a lawyer, has to work with legal English. Um, we could also call the course objectives, the course's smaller learning goal. And um, as you start your studies, I would, um, would love to hear from you more on the portal um, in the forum, for example, about how your expectations to this court, course, our, our expectations for the course are meeting your um, reality. Um, if you ever have a problem, you can let me know, message me there on the portal. Um, but, uh, but today we're going to meet for 20 minutes live and, uh, and actually get some um, advice from senior students about learning legal English. Um, and that is exactly 2.55 to 3.15 this afternoon when we will jump onto the course's Zoom link for the first time. Zoom link is in yellow, I think it is, on the front of the portal course homepage. Um, and you'll get to meet me and each other and even those upper year RDSL students then. Um, they will have some words of wisdom for you, hopefully, based uh, on their own journeys and experiences as legal English students. Um, there will also be one video posted with this lecture uh, from one of the senior students who could not join us in person today. So that's what that is about. And you can look at that too. All right. I've been speaking very quickly, so I'm going to slow down. And as I get into the housekeeping items, um, so that you will have a chance to write notes without having to pause the recording playback again and again. Um, but of course, feel free to pause. Um, one of the reasons I'm recording this is because, uh, well, for one thing, internet uh, connections can fall apart sometimes and you might miss some words that I'm saying um, or you might have a disaster with your internet connection and I wanted to be sure um, that everybody would have a chance to listen to all the words of this lecture in the very first week of class while you're getting yourself all set up. Um, and I know my own daughter, who was last year a first year psychology student uh, at a university um, in Scotland, she really enjoyed the recorded lectures. So I'm trying to do a bit of a blended thing here and record these lectures as a resource for you. And then we'll meet very often in person on Zoom, um, in person, quote unquote, on Zoom, and get to talk one on one um, in smaller groups. So lectures are so one way uh, often, and it's not so fun to sit on Zoom and just listen to someone else. So uh, hopefully you can sit here now and listen to someone else um, and get a cup of coffee and pause if you need to. OK, housekeeping notes to begin. This here is uh, my favorite fictional first semester law student, Elle Woods, from the wonderful movie Legally Blonde. Um, and uh, as you can see with her glasses and sweater and and even a tie there, um, she knows how to get serious and focused as she begins to take notes um, on the important things in her first week of classes. And that is what I invite you to do now. Housekeeping note one is that Elle Woods is a good example for you. Take good notes in every one of your, at least legal English classes. Uh, whether it is a pre-recorded lecture 
for a live seminar and also while you do your readings. You should take notes that you'll be able to refer back to, read again, correct if necessary. Um, it's a very good visual and physical and auditory exercise that helps you retain information and work with information. Okay, number two. Uh, when you're on the Zoom call, or any Zoom call in the class, all the seminars will be on Zoom and we'll probably meet as well um, for certain feedback, uh, smaller group sessions and some question and answer before the exam and so on. Um, but every time we're on Zoom, please have LB for Law and Business or LD for Law and Diplomacy um, and your first then last names um, as your Zoom name when we are live on Zoom. And it's best to have it in a spelling you think will help me not embarrass myself as I try to pronounce it, um, at least until I've, um, uh, well, I've, I take legal Latin, I suppose, or, or any uh, uh, Latvian, Latvian, I mean, not Latin. Um, best would be the name you'd like me to call you, but also be aware that it should, it should, it should give me a hint or it should match also whatever the attendance sheets uh, for the class say. The RGSL uh, office will have your name in a certain way and on the list of students. Um, because if I can't match those to your Zoom names, I will have a very difficult time marking you present for each session um, and to call on you uh, to help you practice your speaking skills and make sure I've covered every student in that way. Um, okay, housekeeping number three. Um, while attendance or seminar work is not formally graded, your having attended each seminar is expected. Uh, so this tip is, or housekeeping item is, plan your schedule and come to every seminar um, and, and plan some time to prepare for it. Um, if you absolutely must miss one, for example, if you are so sick that logging in from under your blankets at home simply will not work for you, um, because we are always going to be a virtual class, so a little sick is okay. <laughs> um, you can, I would rather have you need to turn off your camera because you're blowing your nose, um, but still be with us for a seminar um, than to miss it. Um, but, uh, but if you are so sick uh, or otherwise have a problem and cannot attend one session, hopefully it will only be one, maybe two, um, please get the, the notes from someone else. And someone you trust who takes detailed notes and studies well and get the notes so you don't miss any of the material that might pop up on the exam and more importantly in your law school and professional life. Um, class participation is also crucial. It's extremely important for getting the most out of this class for yourself and even for the other students to get the most out of this class. So please do it. All right, uh, number four housekeeping item is um, about Zoom etiquette and professionalism. I know you've already heard this, but please also have your cameras on as much as possible. Um, I do understand if one day your bandwidth is absolutely awful and you must shut off video for a few minutes at a time to hear us. Um, but in that case, please, um, please do, um, shut off the video for a few moments, try to put it on again, uh, let us know what's going on in the chat if you can't turn on the video, um, and just you know, be serious about being a participant in the class. The default has to be the cameras are on. Um, although I don't mind you standing and stretching and drinking water and petting your cat or dog or stuffed animal um, within reason, uh, because we are a university class and not a courtroom. Um, there are times that I will code switch and I will um, I will give you more of a sense of what it's like to um, act very professionally and speak very eloquently and formally in legal uh, English. But um, but during our seminars, we can be a little bit more relaxed and focused on um, learning the subject matter at hand. Um, number five, finally. Thanks for completing the little introductions to yourselves online um, about where you were from and your languages, what you studied before and what you've liked to study um, and what activities outside of school are important to you or enjoyable to you. Um, 
have read all of the intros and I encourage you to read your fellow students intros as you get to know each other and work together on class exercises. Um, I must say as an American who only learned my native English uh, and a few years of high school French by the time I entered university, I am particularly impressed with all of your foreign language expertise. Um, many of you speak and read and probably think in multiple languages beyond your own mother tongue uh, or tongues. And um, knowing so many different languages will definitely help you understand and recall the new legal English vocabulary and usage that you'll study in this course. Um, your pet photos were impressive too. I promise I will share more dog photos and you will also see my little dog Scout on Zoom um, because here in Sweden we are also working from home uh, until later in September. Sorry about the uh, ringing there. My telephone ringer wasn't off and uh, it's my um, first time this semester recording a lecture. So I, uh, I'm trying to be careful and uh, not fancy about it. So I'm not gonna go back and edit that out. Um, but anyway, you will see more of my little dog Scout on Zoom uh, and maybe I'll see more of your pets um, because I know you're home for the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, getting all of your class uh, meetings by uh, online, on digital, in other words. Um, and also in Sweden, we are digital, working from home until later in September um, to try to get safe and make sure that this pandemic finally ends and everyone can go back to um, studying and you know playing hard and working hard in person like, uh, like you really need to be doing in undergraduate years in, uh, in your university experience. Um, so, okay, I said I'd introduce after housekeeping a bit of the field of study, and the world of knowledge that we call legal English. And uh, that's what we do next. Um, we'll move on to, um, to uh, actually talking about that, but uh, I'd like to pause and ask you to think about some of your expectations um, for the course that are possibly tied to you becoming a fully trained lawyer. Um, if you are thinking, oh, after this law school experience, I will know all of the legal terms and all the concepts, and I will know how to write and think and speak um, pretty much like a lawyer, um, that's great. It's good to have uh, ambitions. <laughs> Maybe those goals are a bit overwhelmingly large, though. Um, and for this module one class, we only have a few short weeks together. So remember that. Um, it will help you though to spend as much time with the material as possible. And maybe you will come farther than you could ever have hoped or dreamed just by really warming up your brain in legal English. Um, so I encourage you to uh, read, but also watch films, listen to podcasts, everything you can about law even in English. and um, don't worry if you haven't already done this. Um, we're all supposed to be new, or you are <laughs> all supposed to be new to law, uh, pretty much, and that's what your introductions indicated. But um, it's it's good to know that you're starting from the beginning, and um, will help you get further along the road. Okay. Um, the last thing in housekeeping is that uh, the advanced students are an important source of information for you on what you should be taught uh, or what you should be focusing on in your legal English learning. So, um, and this is proven by research that, uh, that advanced students or, or people who have already learned uh, the, the subject um, are a very good resource for helping students um, prepare for their academic and professional lives. Um, in which they will use legal English because they know better than anyone what exactly you will need and where your confusions and problems might be. So, um, for example, uh, the researcher Barbora Chauvinkova in 2013 wrote uh, Legal Minds, she wrote an article called Legal Minds Think Alike Legal English Syllabus Design and the Perceived Language Needs of Present and Former Students of Law. Um, and the teaching in this course will be formed by research such as that. Um, that is why, for example, I am going to introduce you to some of these senior students today in the last 20 minutes of class. Uh, okay. The field. I hope in the, in the recording you can see Elle Wood saying, what? Like it's hard. Um, because she's hilarious and that is a good movie to start with if you want to start watching some movies in legal English. 
We're also keeping a list of movies on the portal, so you can look at that um, and even add to it if you have any movies or um, maybe even TV shows we could add in there uh, to uh, recommend to your fellow students. Um, now we'll talk about the field of study uh, and the world of knowledge that we call legal English. Real English is defined in historical relation to general English in your readings for this week, uh, but also in, in scholarship. Um, particularly, you'll see in the pages by Rupert High from his book, Legal English, you're going to be reading. Um, is, of course, a subset of the broader English language, which you have already studied. And today, we distinguish legal English from that general English, from business English, medical English, any of those kinds of alternate subsets of English. Um, there may be a great variety of different areas of legal English that students um, who are not native to the English language um, will find challenging, um, but it is uh, particularly um, important that you realize that native speakers of English as well have not learned this language. But okay, let's make a distinction in order to kick off this week's focus, which is defining legal English and proficiency, what it means to be good, in other words, what it means to be adequately good uh, for today's law students, meaning you. So legal English is different from general English. Uh, taking a class in it is also different. Um, legal English is considered an ESP, in other words, English for specific purpose, um, and therefore it does not introduce you to the general English words or things for your kitchen uh, or um, for writing contracts about cars. We won't talk about different parts of cars. Um, we won't talk about general academic English terms, sort of the fancy words like syllabus and so on that you will hopefully learn in uh, your other English course, uh, the general academic English course. Um, real uh, English, in, in other words, introduces you to what you need to know to work as a trained lawyer in English. Um, or, and this is a really important category of what you'll learn, um, it, it teaches you to talk about the law in English for when you encounter the law, but you're actually working in your own native language or languages. Um, and that happens a lot where you'll be working in, for example, a Latvian law firm, you'll read a contract in English, and you need to be able to understand the English and talk about it in your native language. Um, I don't speak Latvian, and we won't be focusing on anything but the legal English side right now, but it's helpful for you to think about that, that you want to learn these words in a way that is tied to your other languages in which you might work. Um, and for that reason, during our learning, I'm going to ask you to translate the terms and concepts you're learning in legal English to your other language or languages. That's going to be part of uh, what you're doing for um, the personal glossary notebook project that we'll talk about more next time. Um, okay. What are some of the main features of legal English that are different from general English? Well, for one thing, it is both more and less clear. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, legal English is, for example, when you write a contract or a brief for the court, it is structured and it uses words that are special and distinct. Um, they are used we hope, consistently these words. So for example, in a contract, uh, one does not refer to the car, the vehicle, the sports car, the Porsche, um, but instead one uses the same word and defines it right from the beginning uh, to make it kind of almost like math, you know, very clear and to avoid any ambiguity um, that can be exploited by someone who wants to say, violate the contract. Uh, and we'll talk more about that during our seminars. But um, so you can see how legal English might even be more clear than general English. Um, it's not poetry. It's not creative writing, um, not with respect anyway to the creativity of finding different ways to say the same thing. Um, but then again, it is less clear. 
is jargon. Uh, there are words used differently than they are used in everyday, uh, what I heard a student call rom-com English, romantic comedy English, that a lot of people uh, feel that they speak because they watch a lot of films and YouTube videos and so on. Um, and it's different than words that are used in business or public life as well. Um, in fact, I don't want to make legal English too distinct from EU English, um, but it is a, a joke that is told when we teach um, European Union uh, law uh, that sometimes the European Union um, political agents and, and various institutions use English in a very unique way. Um, some, some particularities of EU English uh, might be different from legal English for other, in other contexts. Um, but that's an aside. And you don't need to memorize uh, these differences so much um, as under, well, you don't need to memorize specific differences. It's good to know um, some of the ways that we're talking about today. So not saying this isn't on the test. How is legal English distinct? Uh, some of the main features of legal interests that are different are, and thus may cause problems to non-native speakers of English uh, and to native speakers who are not yet lawyers, um, are, according to research, um, the following. Archaic words and expressions. In other words, e.g., which means, for example, uh, there to, there on, there of, um, or rarely used words and expressions. This is something that the Crosslinder uh, textbook talks about, um, as well as uh, a few others. Also, there's a book by Williams from 20, 2004 uh, that uh, reflects on how the inclusion of foreign words and expressions, especially from Latin or French, um, makes legal English distinct from general English. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, well, you see in your readings, the discussions about Old English and uh, Old French. Um, we also have, so that's foreign words, then the frequent repetition of words, particular words, expressions, and syntactic, syntactic structures. Instead of using, for example, the pronouns that we use every day when we speak English, like he or she or it, um, in, in, in legal English, you might use uh, the same word like the car again and again and again, or the, the defendant or uh, something like that, Facebook incorporated. You might use that word or that phrase again and again and again instead of saying it um, because it is more clear and less likely to get confusing. Um, there's also lengthy and complex sentences in legal English, uh, but hopefully not. I put a question mark after that one, lengthy sentences, because hopefully not so often that it interferes with your um, understanding of a piece of legal writing. So it's not actually a goal to write with lengthy, complex sentences. It's more of a goal, modernly, um, to write in simple, direct language, even in legal English. Um, but you will see uh, there are a lot of sentences with intricate patterns of coordination and subordination, quote unquote, as Cross, uh, Linder, and Translegal wrote in 2009. Um, there are passive constructions. I think you know what the passive voice is. That is also not something that we want to do in legal English, but it is uh, sometimes helpful. Like if you don't want to accuse, when you're writing a, a letter to a opposing counsel and you don't want to accuse her client or his client of uh, something terrible, um, but you do kind of want to accuse his or her client of something terrible, you can say, um, the car was definitely destroyed during the week in question instead of your client definitely destroyed the car. You see what I'm saying? So that's the passive constructions. Um, there are also homonyms. Uh, and this is a grammatical term that, um, that means that um, a word is, the same word uh, means two separate things in two separate contexts, um, like in legal English and in general English. Um, 
and for example I have consideration written down there because as you'll learn during the contract um, seminar or lecture I forget which one it is now um, consideration is a very specific term in common law contracts um, so it's very much a word distinct to legal English from our point of view um, but of course you've probably learned the word consideration like he showed me a lot of consideration when he made me chicken soup when I was ill. Um, that's a completely different meaning than what it means in contract law, even though they're pronounced exactly the same way and they're spelled the same way and so on. So um, there are also words that mean the same thing, but they're pronounced a little bit differently and they're spelled the same. So I'm going to take that in a separate slide. Um, there were also some uh, researchers in Lithuania who reported in 2011 that um, Lithuanian learners might sometimes find legal in English difficult due to the fact that unlike Lithuanian legal language, legal English um, is a very historical, traditional, and precise language counting hundreds of years of development. Um, and I think that's, that's a good point, that legal English grew up within legal English culture and history and within just general English culture and history. So um, all of those assumptions that underlie an entire culture might be hidden within some of the ways that we use legal English. And when you're reading a contract written by a native speaker or um, trying to interpret a word used by courts around the world, often in common law jurisdictions, um, these differences uh, behind the words and, and usages and terms will perhaps be something you need to think about. Um, and maybe that's true in Latvian, right? Um, or any other languages you speak. You might realize that the meaning behind some words, even though they translate exactly the same, um, might be a little bit different if there was, I don't know, a cartoon on television that everybody watched when they were growing up. Um, I'm thinking now of the, the Garfield uh, comic that was later a live cartoon and um, Garfield the cat ate uh, lasagna very often. So American English speakers at least might have a different idea when, when they think of lasagna and uh, you ask them to say, you know, brainstorm a bunch of words associated with lasagna, they might say cat. And it might be difficult for someone in another language culture to understand why on earth like, are you, no, what are you putting in the lasagna? Um, no, but, uh, but that's just a, a, an example. Okay, so be aware that the language or the, the subset of language that you're learning in my class will be from within, it grew within legal English, uh, English culture and history. Um, and at the same time, it is uh, used in between um, speakers of all sorts of languages from all over the world now. So I, I wanna make that distinction. We're not learning British law or American law here. Um, we're learning the words of this subset of um of English called legal English. I want to I want to try to help you by making it broader than British or American law. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about common law versus civil law things at another time. Um, I will mention one distinction though. A lot of people say, and you can think about why, that common law systems were built bottom up and civil law systems are in contrast top down, like from the rule book down to the specifics of a given case. Um, but we can take that another time. All right, go to the next slide. Jolly old England. British English can be wordy. Yes, um, some of the research I was just talking about uh, discusses how legal English can be rather wordy with those long complex sentences and those passive constructions. And sometimes I, as an American, wonder if um, some of that is happening because of differences between British and American style, generally. Um, this here is a picture that uh, was on uh, a road in uh, the UK. Um, I didn't take this one, but when I was visiting um, the UK, I remember taking pictures like this because some of the, the signs on the roads are incredibly long and difficult to read, even for me. Um, this is a rather mild example. Um, 
they can be fantastically wordy and I, I feel a lot of culture shock, um, even though I am Northeastern from Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island area of the US, um, where we are a little bit more wordy, I think, than in the South um, or even in California where I've lived um, as well. But uh, anyway, because the ideal of the way you're going to be taught the law does call for clarity and brevity and straightforward um, communication, um, hopefully you won't have to endure too much of the very, very complicated old style, or I might be unfair to say, call it British style, um, as we go through our materials. Um, one, there was one researcher called uh, Loiko who distinguished, quote, two language related challenges, unquote, that non-native speakers of English may face studying legal English. And number one was the peculiarities of its vocabulary and sentence structure and two, the cultural differences between that of a specific national common law jurisdiction uh, and the English learners. Um, the English learners meaning people who are learning English or legal English like yourselves. Um, it was an older focus and you might see that in some of the textbooks or other things you you read about legal English. Um, there was a focus for teaching uh, uh, that that was for teaching legal English students a whole lot about the UK or the US legal systems themselves. Um, I will use cases and examples from courts and statutes and so on, mostly from the US where I was trained as an attorney um, and went to law school. Um, but I will not try to teach you systems specific details that I don't think will help you with your international legal English use. Um, For example, I won't teach you about the specifics of juries or jury trials, um, but knowing the word jury and what it is um, from a, an American context, for example, could be important. Using all of these words, uh, I have an additional note before I move on that I wanted to, uh, to make. Using all of these words carefully and knowing as much as you can about them is important for a reason that I think any practicing lawyer would think of. Um, can you think of it? Why would you want to be precise? We already talked about with the contract example, clarity. Um, there's also a, a term in legal practice called CYA, and you can Google that if you want, but uh, cover your, yes. Um, being very precise and specific helps you um, be detailed enough to not get yourself in any kind of trouble professionally. Um, when dealing with opposing parties and um, drafting contracts for your client and so on. Um, also, there are certain rituals, as one learns in anthropology or other fields. Um, rituals are a human behavior that signifies serious important moments and commitments and transitions in life um, that are marked by most or all human societies with special ceremonies of one kind or another. And in a way, legal English is used in, in these kind of legal special ceremonies um, that might not exist in ordinary everyday life. Um, and uh, so it makes sense that the words would sometimes signal that, for example, by signing this paper, you will be committing to sell your house to this other person, or you will be creating a corporation legally, or you will be swearing that you are testifying about the true facts within your personal knowledge, quote unquote. These are some ways, some phrases that are written down in court documents and other legal um, English uh, on, on, on in diff different legal English contexts um, that they're going to be always the same or they're going to remind people who have studied law in English um, of some of these um, very specific um, ceremonies and, and the importance that it, that it signals to something. Um, I hope that is clear, but we'll, we'll get back into it. Okay, so in conclusion, there are a great variety of ways that you might find legal English challenging and time consuming in terms of studying. That's why we want you to get organized and psyched up now um, and start to prepare your own personal glossary or 
alphabetical list of English terms and concepts with definitions and translations into your own languages. Um, so you can build that dictionary for yourself as part of your studying, but not, not replacing your regular note taking, um, just as a separate project. And we'll talk more about that. Um, for now, though, if you do want to start a file on your computer where you write down all these words and or some kind of table, and you can alphabetize it later. I think that would be wise. That's how I would do it. Okay. Remember how I said there are some words, ho homonyms, that are said and spelled exactly the same but mean different things in legal English than in general English? Um, there are also uh, ones that, heteronyms, that sound different because they are pronounced um, differently or with different emphasis on different syllables, parts of the word, um, but they mean different things. And this is true in other languages as well. Um, this kind of relationship between two terms where one is pronounced differently than the other and means something different. For example, in Swedish, because I teach mainly in Sweden, um, I wrote down the example hälsapå, and or actually hälsapå and hälsapå. Um, and the first one means to say hi to someone, and the second one means to visit that person. Um, so that's just a non Swedish law example, a non-legal or yeah, legal Swedish example, um, but you see how it works. Here are some examples uh, from legal English and general English. Um, so I'll go ahead and pronounce them for you here and explain a little bit. Um, a defect is something wrong with a product. To defect is to abandon your country, for example, when athletes defect at the Olympics in a foreign country um, and leave their country of origin um, to seek asylum uh, or otherwise immigrate to another country. Um, so that's defect and defect. There's also record, like a recording, uh, the old school plastic discs that people play, records, and record. And to record something, of course, you can record like a lecture. That's what I'm doing now. But you also can um, record a, a property deed at a recorder's office. This is filing a record with the state to, um, to make sure that everyone who has a legal interest is aware that someone has, for example, purchased a property or taken a mortgage out on a property that must be paid before the property can again be sold. Um, the third example is perfect. I'm sure you know that word because you're also perfect. Um, but there's also to perfect. Um, and to perfect something is to, in, in legal English, to, to fix um, a defect, actually. Um, you could perfect title to a property, for example, by paying off an old delinquent mortgage. Then there's the example permit. I have to be careful how I say it the first time. So if you will permit me to hold your coat, I will put it in the coat closet for you, right? Um, but permit, permit me, yeah. But a permit, you don't say, would you permit me? You say, would you permit me to put your coat away? Um, but a permit, is a legal uh, permission from usually the state or some kind of authority to uh, conduct some kind of activity. For example, I have a permit to sell hot dogs at this sports event. Okay, and the last one is object. I think you all know what objects are, things, physical things. Um, and I think you actually also know this word in legal English. I object, your honor. I object that fact is not in evidence. Um, and we'll talk more about this court kind of uh, words in a future seminar. What other distinctions can you find as you read for seminar one? Um, and as you think about this, I'll leave that to your own um, pre preparations for seminar. Um, also, again, write these words down for your draft personal glossary notebook. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Okay, time is not endless today, and especially the resource of your energy um, is not endless because you have a lot of new things going on this week. 
So I want to briefly introduce you to the two seminars you'll be having this week on Friday and on Monday. Again, I shouldn't have mentioned the names if I want to use this lecture again. Oh well. A little more about the course, third and final part of today's lecture. Um, the course outline shows the structure for the course. That's the part that you should read on your own. I don't want to go too far into it uh, in lecture. Um, but if we just look at the immediate future, you'll have uh, this lecture and then seminar one, which is going to focus on legal English in law school, in government work, and in legal practice. And uh, it will occur, the seminars, both seminar one and two and other seminars, in your three different groups. So please remember to come to your group session and log in the way we talked about before. Um, watch the calendar. The, I mean, the GSL calendar for year one for any last minute changes. Uh, sometimes they happen, I know. And um, make sure you get the portal app. You can have the, you can see the portal on your phone as well as on your computer. So that's a tip. Um, seminar one is going to cover, here L Woods is looking very serious, um, concentrating hard. But seminar one will cover um, the law school substantive subjects, in other words, the legal areas as they're usually taught um, and broken up for law school courses in, uh, in English or English language speaking law schools in any case. Um, also skill building, legal research and writing and oral advocacy and client skills that one learns um, during law school classes and activities. Then we'll cover legal sources, like the sources of law, where to find what the law is, um, their creation and application, creation by the government usually, or the state, um, or an international agreement organization. Um, there, we will cover the types of lawyers and judges and courts that you will have to be able to talk about in legal English. Um, and legal English as used professionally in the practice of law, but also related careers, because some legal professionals work in nonprofit organizations. They work in NGOs, which is non-governmental organizations. Um, the UN, for example, or um, doctors, what is it called in English? Doctor, uh, <laughs> Médecins sans frontières in French, uh, doctors without borders in English. Lots of uh, places like that. Uh, the Red Cross, for example, is another one. Um, so by the end of Friday, you will have thought a lot more about these subjects um, and other ones that are mentioned in things. Um, and then after Friday's seminar one, you'll have seminar two. Seminar two, legal English proficiency for legal professionals like you. Um, and in that seminar, we're going to do a, a skill assessment, actually. Um, so that you're going to sit down and do some work with me when you're on Zoom that day. Um, make sure you're in a quiet, relaxed place and you can um, focus, uh, hopefully writing um, with pencil and paper or into a document um, but on your computer, but it's really important that you not use any resources at all because this is a pretest meant to show me what you can already do. And if you were to use resources like spell check or grammar check or anything like that, um, you would give me a, an artificially strong view of what you can already do. And then I would have to make the class more difficult. And you don't want that. You want me to meet you where you actually are. Um, so please. Think about that for Monday, and we'll be taking these core skills assessments that I'll tell you about then, and we'll be doing them together on Zoom. Um, okay. Going back to the course as a whole, uh, please reflect a bit on how to think about the learning goals. We will reflect a bit on this uh, in the next slide. Um, so we'll read the course outline for the substance and then for how to approach these things. Let's talk about it now. Consider what you expect to achieve to your goals. And this ties into your role as the student learner, the main person in charge of your learning, um, and the one in charge essentially of what you get out of your education. Um, the pedagogy for this course, I just want to have mentioned, 
um, is, like the others here at the RGSL Law School, student-centered rather than teacher-centered. So I really shouldn't be feeding you many, many facts in this lecture that you can write down and learn. The idea is to encourage you to go find and work with and have to rest, wrestle with some of these concepts, okay? And so if you ever feel frustrated and you're having to read cases and find answers and work through exercises, um, part of that is I mean, that's because we're a good school. <laughs> it's, a, it's an ideal form of pedagogy proven by research to help you learn better than you otherwise would, okay? Um, not just the content, but the skills you need to succeed in your life and in your work. So, student centers means professor as guide on the side. I'll be your coach, your personal trainer, your mentor, uh, but not your spoon feeder, in other words. And the learning goals will be focused on what you as a student will be able to do at the end of the course, um, not what I will have taught you to memorize and, and spit back at me. Um, this is kind of modern, it works for as many kind of different kinds of students as possible. Um, there are certain special supports that help most students that I will try to use, like presenting things in different ways, visually and auditorial, uh, through audio um, as well. And teacher centered on the other side would be the professor as a sage or wise man or woman on the stage. Um, learning goals focused on what the teacher will impart upon the students, like a long list of terms you'll learn. Um, traditional, uh, th this kind of learning is considered traditional and it works for some kinds of students, um, but other students may fail or become unmotivated through it. Um, or be given special supports that they wouldn't necessarily need if the, if the student-centered approach was used. Um, so I, as I say, as your coach, I'm going to bring you, um, what I will do, I will take responsibility for is to, one, bring you an organized exposure to high quality, uh, carefully chosen material from which you can learn. And number two, um, I'll even make it as motivating as I can. I'm trying to make things fun, lively, trying to motivate you and help you work to help you succeed. Um, not want to trip you up, trick you, see you struggle, not too much, not unnecessarily. And I don't want to see you give up, obviously, on completing the course or the entire degree program. Um, so hopefully that kind of best practice pedagogy is what you're excited to embark on, even though it does mean potentially a little more work on your part um, and a little bit more feeling uncertain of what comes next. Okay. All right. I'll be absolutely clear. Only you can do this work. Set it up for yourselves and you will succeed. You, uh, you know that you are expected to spend more time studying than the time that is available in class. Um, be clear on your priorities, therefore. Think about if you, you know, if you've signed up for this full-time job as a student, how much you can reasonably fit in of other activities and work. Um, put in 40 hours a week on this stuff, um, but please stay healthy. Don't put in much, much more. Um, tell me if this is too much. Um, definitely be in communication about that. But study and you will do fine. All right. So about special needs and everyone is special in some way. We all have special strengths and special challenges. Um, but if you have any particular difficulties that can impede or challenge your learning, please, um, if you have cognitive or developmental or emotional or physical or attentional issues, you can feel free to let me know and uh, what how I can help you, okay? That, the main subjects, again, you're going to read about in the course outline, and we will discuss it more in the future. Um, that is basically my lecture, which I need to get uploaded for you so you can start watching it. There do exist for this course um, to let you know learning materials outside of um, the ones that we will use and will be uploaded on the portal. You don't have to use these other materials, um, but you may. And there's also professional exams um, that you might see online and maybe some practice materials or study materials for those exams. Uh, one of them is called the ILEC, for example. Another one is the POLES. Um, 
POLES teachers point out that listening to legal English and reception of language is important and sometimes difficult. Uh, but writing is even more important for a lawyer practicing in English, and it is more um, it is more difficult for you. I know from last year uh, that it is, and that's the case with both students. So writing involves production of language with precision, and um, so the TOLES also focuses on testing whether students can do that, and we practice a lot with that in this class as well. Okay, as much as we can in the first semester of your education. Uh, so just know that these exams are out there, as are other learning materials online and in the library and on YouTube um, to use to practice them. Um, I can mention too that um, last fall semester translegal.com offered a course called Intro to Legal Interest, uh, Legal English Online, and it was free. It's usually 350 euros uh, thereabout. So uh, I don't know if they'll offer something similar this year, um, but I did, when it was free, save a few of the little quizzes from that course, and um, I saved them as supplementary material on the portal course website. And they're there this year if you want to look. Um, you'll therefore have some concrete self-tests and you'll be able to review the correct answers. Um, it can be a fun, gamified way you can study for this course. Um, but prioritize learning the terms and concepts and skills we emphasize in lectures and seminars um, by doing all the assigned readings and exercises um, first, um, but then you can use these extra resources. Um, also focus on doing well for your several weeks long personal glossary notebook project, of course. Um, then you can do these extra things and they might be a real help to you. Now that you've listened to this lecture, we're going to pause to think and um, I want you to jot down into your notebook for yourself an answer to the following question. As I start studying legal English, what is my starting point? For example, with listening and speaking and reading and writing skills. And what do I expect uh, and hope to accomplish by the end of this course, realistically? Um, consider how comfortable and familiar you already feel with general English, maybe some business English, even a little bit of legal English. Um, but consider what your strengths are and what your difficulties are and um, the time you commit to studying, uh, what, the time you can commit to studying, and what kinds of studying are probably, if you're honest with yourself, most effective for your learning. In other words, do you learn deeply enough by watching YouTube or lecture videos or listening without working with notes and exercises repeatedly? Uh, most people do not. It takes working actively uh, with material. So when and where you will sit down to study and the fact that you will commit to yourself to actually write answers to the exercises and not just read the questions and think in your brain that you can come up with the answers um, without working with it, with it um, before checking the answer key. That Those are the kind of things you need to commit to doing in order to help yourself out. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture online. And next we will meet on the Zoom link. Uh, where you will see, you'll get some words from wiser students, the senior students. I clicked very quickly through that slide, but yes, I'll see you soon. Thanks for today and welcome to the course. This is my email here at RGSL, um, but also I'd prefer if you write in the forum for all the students to see or in the messages part of the portal. And that way all the messages will be in one place and I won't lose them within my, my email. Uh, I'll talk to you soon and good luck with your studying. Bye-bye.